Recording started. All right, well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, Mini Grand Rounds today is uh, on benzodiazepine tapers. Uh, it's a really important topic. I think we spent a lot of time talking about narcotic uh, prescriptions and how we can prescribe those in a safer manner, but just as important is the uh, prescribing of other controlled substances. Uh, Kelly Barnes, who's one of our uh, clinical pharmacists that works uh, in the division, is going to give us this talk. She's a real expert in, in all things pharmaceutical, and we're really looking forward to hearing her talk today. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. So I think this is something we encounter a decent amount in clinics, so I'm hoping to give you a little bit of background today that kind of gives you some strategies for starting the discussion with the patient. That's kind of the first step. Then we'll talk about how benzodiazepine pharmacokinetics play into withdrawal symptoms and also into tapers. We'll outline strategies for creating benzo tapers, and then we'll talk about a patient case. So I think everyone's pretty familiar. There are a number of benzodiazepines out there. They all work the same way. So they all potentiate the effects of gamma amino butyric acid, which is one of the major inhibitory neurotransmitters in the brain, um, to decrease firing or decrease that excitation in the brain. They do have differences in their pharmacokinetics and in their activity profiles, so they're used a little bit differently. When we think about benzodiazepine uses, I think probably the most common place we see them used in primary care is for the different anxiety disorders. And they're very effective at decreasing the somatic and autonomic symptoms of anxiety, but they don't do much for that apprehension and worry. And so because of that, they probably shouldn't be used first line for anxiety. Where they really, I can think, can be pretty effective is in that delay the treatment that we see with antidepressants, and maybe some of that initial activation that we see with antidepressants. We also see them used for insomnia, so the American Academy of Sleep does recommend benzodiazepine use for treatment of primary insomnia, but again, short-term treatment, not chronic treatment. We see them used as anesthetics, muscle relaxants, anticonvulsants, and alcohol withdrawal. But I think the common theme here is that they really should be used short-term. So there's very small, subset of patients where we should see benzodiazepines used chronically. When I first started practicing, I was kind of naive and I thought absolutely no one should be on a benzodiazepine long term. There's probably a small group of patients that maybe are intolerant to other medications or are on all of the other medications for whatever disorder they have, um, but not the majority of our patients. And why is that? Well, we've seen a pretty large increase in benzodiazepine use, so between 1996 and 2013, there was an increase from about 8.1 US adults, 8.1 million US adults being prescribed a benzodiazepine to 13.5 million in 2013. At the same time, for each adult prescribed a benzodiazepine, the quantity tripled and overdose deaths quadrupled. So I think that we see an increase in use and with that we've seen some of the consequences that go along with it. So we'll kind of talk about how can we minimize that. So, there's a couple of things you can do to minimize the abuse potential of a benzodiazepine if you're using them. The first two are pretty straightforward, so use low doses and use them for short-term use. That makes sense, minimizing how much they're out there. The next three are, I guess, less obvious, I think. So ensuring adequate dosing intervals, considering use of the long-acting benzodiazepines, and then avoiding PRN use. And this kind of goes back to thinking about duration of action. So, if you use a short-acting benzodiazepine like alprazolam, the duration is probably four to six hours. If we only dose that twice a day, then the patient takes the medication, their anxiety symptoms go away, but as it wears off, those anxiety symptoms can return, they can have withdrawal symptoms, rebound anxiety, and then they take that next dose, they get rapid resolution of those symptoms and maybe some euphoria, and that can increase the abuse potential. So that's where we get the ensuring adequate dosing intervals Long-acting benzodiazepines have less of that wearing off, so we don't have to worry about that so much. And then avoiding PRN use, that's been recommended as a way to minimize abuse because, again, you don't have the wearing off and you don't already have the symptoms once they're using the medication. However, I have seen patients effectively use PRN benzodiazepines to minimize how much they have to use them, so I kind of have a question mark next to that one. And then, obviously, we here in the division have a control agreement that can kind of help us to hopefully identify those patients that would be at risk for abuse as well. Today what we're going to focus on is short-term use. 
So getting the patient, taking it for that short period of time that they need to take it, and then how do we get them off of it? So I'll kind of put this case in the background of your mind when we talk through papers, and then we'll go back to it at the end. But we have a 72-year-old female, um, has generalized anxiety disorder, has been on lorazepam 1 milligram TID for 10 years, presents the clinic, and had had some falls, actually had had two pretty significant falls, one down the stairs and one in the kitchen on her tile floor um, within the last six to eight weeks. And when we looked at her medication list, there really wasn't any other like anticholinergic medication or any other medication where we thought that could be a cause. So our thought was, let's try to get rid of the benzodiazepine. So I think the first step to tapering a benzodiazepine is really setting the stage with the patient for why would they want to come off of their benzodiazepine. There actually was a pretty large study that showed that by having a conversation with the patient about the risks and benefits of the medication, they were five times more likely to actually stop or minimize their use of the medication. So I think the first step to that discussion actually um, is based on efficacy. So this was a study actually done in the early 1990s, and it compared amipramine, so a tricyclic antidepressant, to diazepam for treatment of generalized anxiety disorder, and it used the HAMA score, so basically the lower the HAMA score, the better controlled the anxiety symptoms are, as a marker for how well the patient was controlled. And what they saw was in the first two weeks of treatment, patients on a benzodiazepine were better controlled. Not surprising because with the antidepressants, we expect there to, to be a delay in treatment. But after that four to eight week time frame, the amipramine, so the antidepressant, was actually more effective um, because it does get at some of those more cognitive symptoms of the anxiety. And so I think this is where you can start to talk to the patient about the fact that antidepressants actually are probably more effective than benzodiazepines long term for treatment of anxiety. A lot of patients haven't heard that before. And then the other part to the discussion with the patient, I think, is really rebounds around the fact that they have adverse effects. I think we're probably all pretty familiar with short-term adverse effects, so obviously CNS depression, which is sedation and psychomotor impairment. Patients usually develop a tolerance to that sedation within the first couple of weeks, but that psychomotor impairment may not have complete um, tolerance to that, and so we see patients on benzodiazepines actually at higher risk for things like car accidents and things like that. Um, we can see some depression, irritability, obviously dependence, tolerance, and abuse. But I think the part that actually plays or resounds a little bit better with patients are the long-term adverse effects. So talking to them about the fact that these medications, if you stay on them, do have some long-term effects. The first thing that they can impact memory and cognition. And so that's not like memory, remembering people's names or remembering like phone numbers, but more like episodic memory. So things that occurred recently or the context in which things that can occurred can be impaired. We know patients on benzodiazepines diazepines have higher rates of falls and fractures, um, specifically elderly patients and then patients who use other sedatives like alcohol. Depression, and this actually is related back to, if you think about GABA, it's one of the major inhibitory neurotransmitters in the brain. So if you're increasing GABA, you're actually decreasing release of norepinephrine and serotonin. So there's thoughts that there's increased rate, risk for depression with benzodiazepine use. Worsening anxiety related to tolerance and then withdrawal from the benzodiazepines and then obviously physical and emotional dependence. So I think that first step when we think about taking a patient off of a benzodiazepine is really to talk to them about the fact that likely they're not the most effective treatment and there are these side effects that are associated with them. So then you have to think about putting together a taper. So why do we have to taper benzodiazepines? It's different from opioids, which we don't necessarily have to taper. Obviously, we do because it's better for patients. But with benzodiazepines, we're pretty much required to taper the medication because it can be life-threatening. Patients can have seizures. What happens is that they take a benzodiazepine, there's changes in that GABA receptor, and it becomes less sensitive to the normal GABA in the body. And so if you take away the benzo, they're at higher risk for seizures. Other risk factors for seizures are obviously patients who have been on high doses of the benzodiazepines. For long durations of time, patients who are on other seizure medications that lower the seizure threshold, like tramadol, bupropion, metronidazole, some of those antibiotics, and then patients who have an underlying seizure disorder. I think the other thing we have to talk to the patient about is when we taper benzodiazepine, we're doing it to avoid the seizures. We're also doing it to minimize other withdrawal symptoms, but probably we're not going to 
completely take away withdrawal symptoms, right? They may have some of those. Hopefully we are gonna minimize them though. And I do have a screenshot of actually the first case report on here of a, a seizure from benzodiazepine withdrawal. Because I don't know if anybody else is familiar with Dr. Barth, but he's one of the emergency room physicians here at OSU. He actually has one of the first case reports for benzodiazepine withdrawal. And it's actually not that long ago. So even as early as like the early 1980s was when we first started to see that this was a problem. Other withdrawal symptoms we see are things like psychological symptoms, like insomnia, anxiety, depression. We can see physical symptoms like headaches, dizziness, GI upset. So it's again, talking to the patient about these might occur, but we're hoping to minimize them by tapering your medication. I get a question a lot about, do I have to taper it? If the patient's been on a benzodiazepine for more than eight weeks, then it definitely has to be tapered, because that's kind of the time frame that's been shown to be where we see those changes in that GABA receptor that puts them at risk for seizure. I would recommend, even if the patient's been on for less than eight weeks, we probably still want to taper. Um, there's been symptoms as early as two weeks, so it probably makes sense to taper at any point. If a patient's been on a benzodiazepine for more than a year, your taper is going to be at least several months long for it to all be successful for the patient. As far as when we expect to see withdrawal symptoms, if a patient's on a short-acting benzodiazepine like alprazolam, we'd expect to see it in the first one to two days. If they're on a longer-acting benzodiazepine like the diazepam and maybe clonazepam, it would maybe be a little bit longer in that week time frame. And then when we think about tapers, we have to think about pharmacokinetics, and they differ a lot with the benzodiazepines. When we talk about benzodiazepines, they differ in onset of action, duration of action, and metabolism. When we think about tapers, we think primarily about duration of action and metabolism. So if you're tapering a benzodiazepine, it makes a lot of sense to use a long-acting benzodiazepine because you get less of that roller coaster. So it's a more gradual decline and I guess that potency of the benzodiazepine. The other thing you want to think about is if you can use a benzodiazepine that has active metabolites, then as it's metabolized, there's still some activity there. And again, you get that more gradual offset. So the most common benzodiazepine that you see in benzo tapers is diazepam because it fulfills both of those. It has that long half-life and it has the active metabolite. Obviously, you can't necessarily do this if you have a patient with liver dysfunction and you want to think hard about whether you're doing it with an elderly patient because, again, they could have some delay in their metabolism as well. So putting together the actual taper, there are a number of resources out there for putting together a taper, and they all differ a bit. So what I want to do is kind of go through maybe four of the resources that I see used commonly, and then I've sort of picked out bits and pieces that I use when I put together a taper, and I'll kind of show you how I've done that. <laughs> the first one I was going to talk about is the Ashton Manual. So Professor Ashton's actually um, in the UK, and she is, her study is in psychotropic medication. So she's actually published like 50 scientific papers on benzodiazepines. She took that experience and then her clinical experience, which was in a benzo withdrawal clinic, and put together this manual. So it's definitely not a clinical practice guideline, but it is available in print and it's available online. And it kind of goes through her principles for what she's used over the years for patients taking them off of a benzodiazepine. The first thing she talks about switching to long-acting benzodiazepines, which we kind of already talked about, specifically diazepam. But the next thing you have to think about is the available of the benzodiazepine. So if you think about a patient who's on clonazepam, if you wanted to taper them off of clonazepam, the smallest you would be able to go would be 0.25 milligrams or half of that 0.5 milligram tab. So that is a lot bigger of a step down than if you were on diazepam because you can go down to two milligrams, which is a lot less potent, and you could cut that in half. So there's been times where I've tapered patients off of their benzodiazepine that they're already on because that would probably be easier than switching them or they may not understand if we switch them. But sometimes it gets really hard depending on the benzodiazepine because you can't make small enough steps for it to be tolerable for the patient. <coughs> You have to think about not only is it long acting, does it have active metabolites, but what are the increment steps that you could make? So she recommends you decrease the dose by one tenth every one to two weeks. And then when you get to even smaller doses around that diazepam 10 milligrams, that you go even slower. She also recommends trying never to go backwards. So if you have a patient and you're tapering off their benzodiazepine, if they start to have symptoms, 
you try to just stay at that dose for maybe four weeks instead of two weeks, instead of stepping back up. And then in her resources, she has examples of withdrawal tapers. So I'll show you one. This is one that she actually has laid out for a patient that would be on clonazepam 0.5 milligrams PID. What you'll notice is she slowly switches to diazepam, then gets down to diazepam to twice a day as quick as possible, because if you think about it, diazepam has a duration of action anywhere from 12 to 15 or longer hours. So she tries to get down to twice a day as quick as possible and then tapers off. What you'll notice here is her first, this first part of the taper takes her 30 weeks, and then she still has to taper off diazepam 10. So her tapers are very long and drawn out. I definitely don't follow them to a T, but you can use some of her guidance. I think she has some good guidance. Um, so her taper off of clonazepam 0.5 CID would take about a year. So we'll kind of talk about what bits and pieces I use from her and what bits and pieces I actually use from other places. The next resource that's out there is prescribers or pharmacist letter. They actually both have it. Um, they have a benzodiazepine toolbox. And they have four recommendations for benzotapers. They have that you can decrease by 25% during weeks one and two, so that's already 50% of your dose off, which is pretty quick. And then decrease by 10% each week after, so that's a pretty quick taper. They have that you taper to diazepam 10 milligrams, stay there for one to two months, and then taper that over four to eight weeks. That's pretty quick as well. Then they have two slower ones. So option three is to taper the dose by 10% every one to two weeks until you get to 20% of your original dose and then taper by 5%. And then their fourth one is to taper by no more than diazepam five milligrams every week, but once you get to diazepam 20, to taper by no more than one to two milligrams. So what you're seeing from these resources is these tapers take quite a while. It takes probably months to actually successfully get a patient off of a benzodiazepine. Current Psychiatry actually has a review article that I think is pretty good. It, it talks about tapering patients off of benzodiazepines in primary care. I kind of use it as a guideline of what's the quickest you could taper a patient off. And so they say if a patient's been off on a benzodiazepine for eight weeks to six months, that you could taper over two to three weeks, six months to a year, four to eight weeks, and then greater than a year, two to four months. And I would say that all of those are pretty quick, and that's probably the quickest you would want to go the patient's probably going to have withdrawal symptoms, but they're probably not going to have seizures with, with this type of length of taper. And then CNS drugs has the most prescriptive taper you'll ever see. What they recommend is you switch the patient to diazepam and then you specifically taper with these doses. What you'll notice is these doses of diazepam are not available in tablets, so this would actually take liquid diazepam, which would be I don't think great for our patients, but it's pr this is pretty much the only resource where you'll see, like, this is exactly what we recommend for a taper. Well, you could cut a suppository. Yeah, they, <laughs> cutting a suppository would, I'm sure, be well received by the patient. <laughs> so those are four resources that I've kind of used over the years when I've put together benzoids and tapers, but I kind of pull things out and put them into, like, my own sort of, I guess, toolbox. So the first thing I think you have to do is think about the length of the benzodiazepine use. So if a patient's only been on a benzodiazepine for a couple of weeks to a month, then that taper is going to be pretty quick. If the patient's been on it for a year, then I think your taper is probably going to take you four-ish, maybe a little bit longer months. Then you have to consider the reason for discontinuation. So is this just a patient that's very motivated, you want to get them off of a benzo because they shouldn't be at it long term, you may go a little bit slower, right, so that they're successful and you get them off. First is a patient that maybe you find out is taking multiple benzodiazepines or is maybe not using the benzodiazepine correctly and you're worried about safety. Then you're probably going to go a little bit faster knowing that the patient's going to have withdrawal symptoms but that we don't feel that the patient can safely take the medication and you might use some of those quicker tapers that you've seen there. If at all possible, you would think about switching the patient to a long-acting benzodiazepine, specifically diazepam because it has the active metabolite. When you are thinking about switching to that diazepam, you should probably look at multiple resources for the equivalent dose, because when you look at different resources, you're going to see different things. Like, for instance, the ASH manual would tell you that alprazolam 1 milligram was equivalent to diazepam 20, but if you look at prescriber's letter, it's going to tell you 1 to 10, and most places are going to tell you 1 to 10. So it's important to kind of look at a couple of things when you're starting to make that change. <laughs> 
When you make that switch to diazepam, I usually also make the first dose decrease at the same time. And the reason behind that is because, say a patient's on lorazepam, lorazepam actually has less hypnotic effect, less sedation than diazepam does. So if I switch a patient from lorazepam 1 milligram to diazepam 10, they're likely going to be more sleepy because that diazepam has more of a hypnotic effect. So I switch to the equivalent dose and make that first step down when I switch the patient to diazepam. So when Professor Ashton does it, she makes one step at a time to kind of combat that sleepiness. I usually switch all three doses or all of the doses to diazepam at one time, but start that first step down because it can be different activities. I think close follow-up to the patient obviously is key. You want to make sure that you assess the withdrawal symptoms and again, trying not to step back up on the dose, but if a patient's having withdrawal symptoms, trying to stay at that dose for longer, maybe four weeks, six weeks before you make the next step down. Because a lot of times by the time we talk to the patient, they're actually through the worst of the withdrawal symptoms. So let's just stay there, let you get used to it and then step down again. And then I think considering weekly or two week, every two week prescriptions is good because patients get confused. Like this is hard, right? There's a lot of steps. And so by keeping them on those every two week prescriptions that help them stay organized on where they should be because the directions on the bottle will actually match what they should be doing. With that being said, patients may end up paying more co-pays that way because a lot of times patients pay the same amount for the supply they get, whether it's 30 days or 14 days. So you kind of have to play that game as well. So taking us back to our patient case, we had the 72-year-old female on lorazepam 1 milligram PID for 10 years, quite a long time, not on any other medication for anxiety. So what do we want to do? Well, we talked to her about the fact that there are a lot more effective medications for anxiety that don't maybe have the same side effects that benzodiazepines do. She was very, very resistant to trying an antidepressant medication. We still talked to her about tapering. She was pretty open to tapering, especially with the falls that she had been having. So what we did was we looked up equivalent doses for lorazepam, 1 milligram PID. That would be diazepam, 10 milligrams PID. And then we put together a taper for her. So how do we put together this taper? Well, what you'll notice is we made that first step down the first week. So we had her on 10 milligrams in the morning, 7.5 in the afternoon, 2 milligrams in the evening. As quickly as possible, we tapered off the third dose to try to get it to twice a day because there's no reason to be on diazepam more than that. The reason we didn't just split it twice a day is I get nervous about putting patients on a higher amount of benzodiazepine at one time because they could get sleepy or have more faults, right? So we went to TID, we got rid of the afternoon dose as quick as possible. Then we kind of tapered the morning and the evening about the same. But I typically, for most patients, get rid of the morning dose first because patients most commonly complain of insomnia when you taper them off of their benzodiazepine. If you had a patient that had some more like agoraphobia or difficulty leaving the house or anxiety was worse during the day type of thing, then you could think about keeping that morning dose longer and getting rid of the evening dose first. So we put this together, we showed it to the patient, we kind of set the expectation that this was going to take 30 some weeks, this was like six months, right? Um, and that, you know, you'd come back in, we'd assess withdrawal, we might have to slow down the taper depending on how she does. She actually came back to visit too. She told us she felt drugged in the morning, and that might go back to the, the thought that diazepam actually has more of that sedation and hypnotic effect. So we actually sped her taper up and uh, made her morning doses lower than her evening doses for a while. So that's probably the exception to the rule, most commonly we're slowing down, um, but that can happen as well just because of those differences in benzodiazepines. So that is all I have planned. Do people have questions? After we um, <clears throat> like to try not to raise the dose. <laughs> <laughs> it can be hard to deal. Um, concurrent anxiolytic therapy. So, I mean, this patient refused it, which often happens, but even when they initially refuse it, they often need it. And then there's the whole Delay. issue of trying to get them on something else and then titrate that up at the same time you're titrating down mm -hmm. thoughts or recommendations? So I think it depends, again, on why you're stopping. If you're just stopping because you don't want them on a benzodiazepine long term, then it might make sense to start your antidepressant and wait six to eight weeks before you start your benzo taper. If there's an acute reason to stop it, like they're falling or some other reason, 
then you're probably going to have to do the both at the same time. Another thing that I didn't talk about today, but I commonly see is people want to, like maybe the patient's on an antidepressant, they're on a benzodiazepine. So the thought is, let's get rid of the benzodiazepine and start buspirone, because it's kind of our other class. And it's been shown very significantly that if a patient's been on a benzone last year, buspirone is basically not effective because they don't get that. I mean, it's not going to be at the same level of an effect. And so the patient perceives it to be not effective at all. So that's not recommended to switch to buspirone either. I guess the other B, of course, is to, just a reminder, no bupropion because it lowers seizure threshold. <laughs> yeah, but if you're tapering your benzo slow enough, you may be able to use the bupropion as well. well. What other choices? I mean, you showed that graphic with tricyclics. But... So in SSRIs and SNRIs, so first-line treatment of anxiety would be an SSRI or an SNRI. TCAs are just as effective, but obviously have more side effects. And then bupropion actually doesn't have a lot of it evidence for anxiety. It's more just for the depression. But if they had both, you could think about it as well. Would you ever use a phenothiazine if they're still over the top? Oh, good question. So the question is, would you ever use a phenothiazine if they're over the top with, with anxiety? I've never done it, but I don't think that's unheard of. The other thing I see a lot that Spike's doing now, and there is some, you know, off-label or, or evidence is hydroxyzine. They're doing that a decent amount as well. <laughs> but that would be lower, you know, after you had them on everything else that you could get them onto. Just to throw something else in the mix, the Zolpidem, mm -hmm. all those sleep aids. Yeah, so they are, should be tapered as well. I don't know the evidence for seizures with those, but they work similarly. What I commonly see is you have patients on those with benzos, mm -hmm. with opioids. The other thing I think about is, obviously, you're not going to taper everything at once, right? So pick what you're going to taper first, and it's going to be a long work in process. But they should probably be tapered as well. A lot of patients, those are more straightforward because there's not necessarily, you don't see the doses. Like if you see Zolpidem, usually they're on 5 or 10. So you can go down to 5 for a couple weeks and then stop it or, or whatever you need to do for the patient. So if the patient had been amenable to medication, would you have started her on Zoloft? I would have started her on a generic SSRI if she hadn't tried anything else and made sure I set up the fact that it was going to take weeks to work. And then she was falling, so I probably would have maybe started the taper at the same time. Um, but that could be up to it, you know, that could be, people could do different things there. Can you explain again? I'm still not quite understanding the conversion. So you, that patient was on three milligrams total of Ativan a day, and then you went up to 20 half Of diazepam. Yeah, I don't quite understand how. So if you look at, you'd have to look up the equivalency of whatever they're on mm -hmm. to diazepam. So there are a lot of tables out there, and you'll find different resources, different recommendations. Mm -hmm. So for her, lorazepam 1, the most common conversion would be to diazepam 10, which would have been then diazepam 10 PID. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't switch to that because there could be more sedation with diazepam than with lorazepam. Yeah. And patients can have different tolerance. So she might already have some tolerance to lorazepam that may not be completely cross-tolerance to diazepam. So, I would, okay. so the equivalent dose would have been 10 PID, but I would go ahead and make my steps first step down that first week of the taper. Mm -hmm. so that's how much? Well, I just did two and a half milligrams, so that was about 10%. Okay. You could probably be quicker, especially yeah. that high, you could do like 20% for a while until you get to like maybe 20% of the dose, original dose, and then go by like 5% or go low, lower. Okay. So as you get to lower doses, you typically have to go slower or smaller steps okay. between doses. So even when someone's over the age of 65, you you don't make a, a looser conversion. You could. I mean, you definitely could. She had been on the benzo for 10 years, so we were we okay. made. But I think you could have made a looser one for her for two reasons. One, she was 70, and the other was she um, had had some falls. Right. So another right. reason you might want to get off it. I think you could be. You could definitely give her less and not be worried about seizures. You may be worried about withdrawal symptoms, right. but not worried about seizures. Okay. Which is our big thing, right? I'm going to take a moment and just invite everybody that's on the phone line. You can ask questions. You could also send in a chat message if you don't want to announce it to the group, and I can share it with the presenter. I think Hank has another question, though. 
Well, something I should have said right off is this is really tremendous, and thank you so much. Oh, yeah, yeah. Really great stuff. Uh -huh. And I wonder if you would be open, or pharmacy would be in general be open to maybe a consult for this to help us develop the plan? Yeah, so we do it quite a bit, and we're pretty open to doing it. The one thing that gets a little bit hairy is sometimes they'll want the patient to come back for, like, for us to assess withdrawal symptoms, which we've done as, like, pharmacy visits. The hairy thing is making sure that you guys are available to write the prescription. Um, but we're always available. A lot of times what we'll do is we'll put together the whole table at the beginning, we'll put it on the problem list so that it's available, and then, but then still be available as they come back and you say, like, we need to slow down or we need to do these things so we can kind of make changes as well. Well, if you're helping out, I'm going to say I'll be available to my colleagues, you know, to write prescriptions if they're out of clinic that day or mm -hmm. something to see the patient and yeah. write prescriptions. But yeah, we, we do it a decent amount. I feel like we do it more on the resident side because we run into it a lot more. Um, but we're open to doing it whenever. Really, um, it really is a good talk. I step in with Hank said. Um, it seems like the tapering regimen in some ways depends on having a patient who assents to the whole process. And yeah. it's really <laughs> complicated. I guess what I'm envisioning with some patients is that's not possible. You, you put them on eight milligrams of diazepam twice a day, which means you're giving them, what, 112 pills for two weeks, and they take four days to open the emergency room. Yeah. So, so that's where I think I, weekly prescriptions become really important. Two ways. So you could either do weekly prescriptions where you make them stop back by every week, and then you can have like a sidebar with them about how they're doing. Or you could do like four weekly prescriptions called in at the same time with do not fill dates. Mm -hmm. And pharmacists are really receptive to that. And then they can't fill it until every Monday or whatever that might be. Because there are patients that maybe don't understand, but there are also patients who are just going to take it, right? Because they're Maybe they don't necessarily want to taper or they're anxious or whatever that might be. So I think that's where the weekly prescriptions come in. The only downside to that is a lot of times then they're going to pay four copays in a month versus the one copay. So you've had some success doing that even with the more recalcitrant patients? We have, yep. I guess I have a question to build on that. I've had patients where the pharmacy only has, you know, 20 tablets and the prescriptions for 60, and then they release. I'm not even talking about benzos, just in general. Yeah. They release 20 and they tell the patient, we'll come back, we're ordering it, it'll be here tomorrow. It can't do that with other prescriptions, like on purpose. You can't make an arrangement with them. It has to be do not fill because the copay is probably what's going to kill them. Yeah, they, so they, a pharmacy probably won't do that because just think about the logistics of keeping track of that right. and all of that, that they're going to tell you they can't do that. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. But yeah, it is. The copay, it kind of, you have to weigh. Can patients handle it versus are they going to end up paying more? And transportation, if you think about a lot of patients getting to the pharmacy every week, can be an issue as well. I guess you could do a pharmacy visit with, if they brought in pillboxes, you could arrange them for them and label them. Yeah, we could help them arrange them and label them. Yeah. Okay, well, we're, we're getting late into the hour. I want to thank Kelly uh, for joining us today. I think our uh, it's, a, it's a really highlight of, it's a real highlight about the resources we have in our division to have such a skilled clinical pharmacy team. Um, we use them in all different ways and use their expertise in all different ways. I've successfully uh, had them consult for me to help develop a taper for patients on narcotics. Uh, and they did it just the way you described, saving all that information on the problem list allowed um, all, the whole team to have the same message with the patient and stick with the plan, especially when it's over six months you can lose sight of what your original uh, plan was. So um, so I think uh, it's an opportunity for us to try to provide not only good evidence-based care, but hopefully safer care. This is clearly a high danger, uh, uh, high risk drug, and doing the best we can to try to provide safe care is a priority. So thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll post the video on the homepage probably late this week. Uh, I'll send a survey out shortly. We'd really appreciate your feedback. I'm sure Kelly would appreciate your feedback. Um, and then we'll try to get maybe some handouts and post those on the web page too for some of these tapers so it's a little bit more of a practical tool that people can reach out to uh, if they do have a case uh, that needs this kind of effort. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.